She's the founder and chair of Founders for Schools. So she can draw a lot on, on a lot of experiences. And we are very much looking forward to your presentation, Sherry. So please help me to welcome her on stage. Sherry. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Scale Up Challenge and what universities can do about it. Um, and, um, and I might as well start. So um, it's really about, well, what is it? What it, does scaling up mean sort of in a technical, almost in an academic sense? Um, what are the benefits? What's the roles? What are the roles that universities can play? And I've done a bit of a canter around the world, though not to 14 universities, um, to try to just pick out some little snippets of things that I think um, where universities are making a really interesting effort that will result in driving the economic growth of the community of which they're a part, um, particularly around scale-ups and innovative um, companies. Um, and then talk a little bit about the role of place and, um, and what that means. Um, so here's just sort of uh, the ecosystem as I think about it and all the interplay between um, the different parts. So the center of it, I've put entrepreneurs. I would do that because I'm an entrepreneur, but that's not the only reason. Um, and then the, the role of finance, the role of culture, the role of policy and government and uh, markets. Markets really international markets and also corporate markets that you'd sell to. And human capital, again, that by that I really mean uh, the universities. Uh, and the pipeline of human capital that goes through the ecosystem to drive economic growth. Um, so I think this is sort of how I think about these, these sorts of things, and they all have a role. Um, it's a very messy life that I have led there. I used to be an entrepreneur, but then I started doing a bunch of other things. And I think that weird accumulation of having a portfolio for the last 15 years um, has given me a, a different perspective. It's not solely university, it's not solely entrepreneur, it's not solely big company or tiny company or charity. Um, and hopefully this will tell a bit of a story. Um, three years ago, um, I was asked to write a report on um, scale-ups and what the relationship was between entrepreneurship and economic growth. And I think that's because I was very grumpy once in a meeting and somebody was talking about assuming that entrepreneurship would stimulate economic growth and that the policies that they were putting in place was going, were, were going to stimulate economic growth. Um, but I was aware of a lot of research that was coming out of Harvard at the time that was talking about uh, a, an inverse relationship between entrepreneurship and economic growth, particularly if there was a focus on startups, particularly in the instances where there was a talent shortage. So where there's a talent shortage, particularly for innovation, um, startups, and some parts of entrepreneurship actually decrease economic growth in an economy. Um, and as I was aware of this, and this, this sweeping statement was made by somebody, I went, well, if you want economic growth, you're really going to have to do something about your entrepreneurship policies. Um, and anyway, and, and what came out of it was this, um, this research about scale-ups and a different type of entrepreneurship, or again, a facet, a segmentation of entrepreneurship that does drive economic growth and trying to get uh, everyone to think a little bit differently about it. Um, so a scale-up, um, as opposed to a startup, is a company that has been around for at least three years, and it's got at least 10 employees, and the turnover or the employees have been growing for 20% for, uh, for at least two years in a row. And that may sound quite complex. Um, it's the OEC, we can credit the OECD with that definition, um, but, um, but you'll see in a minute why, why that's important. If you can isolate a company with that, those characteristics, um, you can pull some levers, and they're really good levers to pull and to focus on. Um, so um, what's the difference between startup and scale up and why does it matter? Um, I was interested in, I'm, I'm a Canadian, I grew up in a lumber town in Canada, but I moved 30 years ago because of university to the UK. Um, and in 2011, the, the policies in the government really started to key in and started to stimulate the creation of companies. And you can see in 2011 that in the UK, um, they started creating more companies per 100,000 of population in the UK than in any other country, including the US, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, but it's not that neat when you look at the type of companies that were started up as a result of these policies. Um, and you can see the top one are companies with no employees. And starting up 
startups that have no employees actually don't do a whole lot to stimulate economic growth. Um, but what you can also see is that the companies that grew to be large actually went through a decrease over this time. Uh, and you didn't have a really great, you know, not a very high growth in small, small companies or medium-sized companies. Um, and for a healthy economy, what we want, want is, uh, is growth. Um, there's been some great academic studies. This one um, looked at the cohorts of all the companies that had been created and then followed them over a 10-year time period. And this shows that the businesses that were started, if you start with 100,000 of them, you look 10 years in, and um, those that survived are only 37%. Um, and then you start going down and say, well, what does survive mean? Because you kind of make assumption if something starts, it's going to grow big. Um, or you might make that assumption, and some were. Um, surviving um, 10 years and having at least 10 employees got you down to 4% of the business population in, in that cohort. Um, and then survivors that achieved at least one year during that 10-year period of high growth got you down to 2.7% of that business population. Um, and then if you got two successive years of high growth, you were down to, in the UK, 0.5% of the business population. Um, now that's pretty different. Um, and what was really intriguing or annoying was that when you looked at other economies like Canada and Denmark and the US, 0.7% of their economies had these scale-ups. And then I got to wondering, well, what happens, you know, you know does that matter? How sensitive is our economy to um, how many or the proportion of companies that grow and continue to grow? And as it turns out, uh, it's actually very sensitive to that. that. Um, this shows um, the US, UK, and it's a horribly complex graph, but I've got a worse graph coming up. Um, but on the top is there are more in the UK, and on the bottom is there are uh, more in the US. In the middle, you see a very high um, sort of column, and that's for companies that are static. In the UK, we're very, very good at having lots of companies, way more companies there that neither grow nor shrink. And we don't have that many that shrink fast, and we don't have that many that grow fast. And that um, is less than excellent um, on a whole, on a whole bunch of, uh, in a whole bunch of ways. It's healthy to have companies that start up and shrink and go away, because it means that they've tried something, they've high, you know, tested a hypothesis, it hasn't worked, and they've gone on to do other things. Not accepting that a hypothesis hasn't worked and being a walking dead is not good for your economy, nor is actually good for you. Um, so we found that happening. Um, and then um, there's huge amounts of data available, which is brilliant. And then we wanted to know, well, what are the characteristics of this cohort of companies? And this here looks at the turnover growth of, a com of companies by per annum. And on the other side, it's what's the percentage growth? Because we wanted to see if it was large ones growing slowly or small ones growing really fast or what it was. And what you can see here is um, it's a bit of both. Um, and that's kind of fun. And the, we also, in this particular graph, wanted to know the difference between digital companies. Were they all digital or were there some other sort of companies? Um, and what you can see, the, uh, the red ones are digital and the gray ones are, um, are the, L, the other. Um, now, the thing that I also like about this graph is this graph's women-led businesses only. Um, and lots of people say that there's not that many women-led businesses, and lots of people say that women don't lead digital businesses or science businesses, and this kind of shows, well, that it's not true. Um, this just looks at it again. Turnover last year, you've got two, 200 million on the right, zero here, um, and then turnover growth up to 50 million here. It's just visualizing the data and trying to see the populate. What have we got? What kind of businesses are we thinking of interacting with if we are a university? If we're a university student or we're a university um, professor looking to innovate or interact with someone, which one of those did we pick? What are the interesting ones to pick? Do we just pick any old company? Or do we just pick the big companies that have paid us to be part of our, you know, part of our innovation system? Or do we pick the fast-growing ones, the slow-growing ones? Does it matter? How can you tell the difference between a fast-growing one and a slow-growing one? Um, well, it's good. You can actually tell fast-growing ones from slow-growing ones. And if you haven't been asking yourself those questions, you, I, would, um, I would suggest that you might want to start asking yourself those questions. Um, and going back to it, startups don't drive the economy. Big companies do not drive the economy. What drives the economy and innovation in, in this country and other countries are scale-ups, innovative companies. Um, 
and this almost goes back to Porter from Harvard Business School, but competitive advantage of, uh, goes to nations, not the start things up, but the scale things up. And we should think about that when we're thinking about who we're inviting in to collaborate with, who we might be recommending our students think about working for, and who indeed we might want to be a consultant to. Um, and we should be very clear about the difference between A and B. Um, so that goes into, so what is your university doing with scale-ups? And the rest is sort of um, a bit of a rant um, about what you may or may not be doing. Um, and just going on but over, to, over to Scotland for a second, Tom Hunter, who's an entrepreneur there, um, he said that startups are you know, good, but scale-ups are great. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Don't do that again. <laughs> um, if you, uh, we wanted to ask the question, if you had just 1% more of companies that were scaling up, and this is in the UK, the UK numbers, and these numbers were produced by Deloitte, um, if you had just 1% more, what would be the impact on the economy? Um, and the impact on the economy, the net impact on the economy is 225 billion. Um, if you looked at it on a gross basis, and this is over 10 year period of time, with no additional spend, by flexing your current focus and priorities to growing something for a couple or three or four years rather than just starting up another thing, um, very good for your economy and probably very good for your university as well if you're thinking about contracts that you might, uh, you might want to have with them. Um, the productivity impact of growing something and continuing to grow it is also really large. This looks at it, this was a data set that was put together by McKinsey and RBS, uh, and it looks at, again, sort of employment band large, and if you got just one more percent of them into high growth mo mode, what would be the impact on the economy? And in the UK, you can see 1% more of a, and you're trying to graduate companies from small to medium and from medium to large rather than have a whole bunch that are small. Um, the impact, again, is 38 billion on an annual basis, and it really does add up. It's, a, it's, it's huge. Um, so the other thing about why scale-ups are good, they are, they've got huge productivity gains. Um, they create jobs. Many people don't know that three times as many jobs are created by these high growth firms than the FTSE 100 combined. Um, but we only hear about the FTSE 100 um, most of the time. And the media could probably be criticized for only writing about the FTSE 100 or the, or the FTSE 250 companies, um, when in fact they shouldn't, because most of the jobs are being created by these other ones. Um, the other thing that I like is that the the quality of the jobs in these small and medium-sized companies that are growing is very high. You've got satisfaction rates of something like 80% in the people that work for them, whereas if you look at the people that work for large shrinking companies or large static companies, uh, the job satisfaction there is almost through the floor. And then you almost have a moral question, do I want my child to work at a big shrinking company where everybody's miserable, or do I want, to wa want them to work at a large, you know, a small or medium-sized company that is growing? Um, what's better? You know, what's balanced? What is good? What's happening um, in your community? What's, you know, is there a bias one way or the other? And I think we found that there were quite a few biases um, in one direction only, um, and hopefully this will make you think about whether or not you see these biases in your, in your own community. Um, I've, the other thing that we found was that women's, women-led businesses were growing just as fast, if not faster, than men-led businesses, which was really interesting. I like data. It's kind of fun when you see, when you see that happening. Um, we were looking here at the business inventory and whether or not you had an even spread of companies, um, those growing from small to medium, medium to large. Uh, and that just sort of goes through. And it shows that there's quite a lot of regional disparity and variation. And this is just the UK. I'm sure that you've got different pictures in your own, your own countries. Um, we don't want a lot of regional disparity. Um, we don't want cold spots um, and hot spots because in those cold spots, um, th th their, their economies are shrinking and having, well, we've seen the outcomes, we may see even tomorrow some other outcomes um, of, of, again, regional disparity. It's not good. Um, what is interesting is that different industries have different hot spots. This just shows the creative industries here, and you can see that 
you know, nationally for science, it's kind of cold, but when you go into creative industries, it's a hot spot, which is a good news for some parts of the economy. That making sure that those creative com companies that are down in Cornwall grow and continue to grow and have some focus, because strategically they're really important um, for that part, that part of the world, is something we should think about. Um, this here looks at holding constant population. And this looks at the scale-ups per 100,000 of population by region in the UK. Um, and you can see, well, you can see Lon there is a London effect. Um, and you can see that you know, sometimes per 100,000 of population, um, no, you're, not, you're not all in equal starting spots. And if you're here, you would want to get up your, po your, your proportion of companies that were growing um, so that you were in a better place. And then we looked at um, whether or not the proportion per 100,000 was growing or shrinking. Um, and um, Cumbria, unexpectedly, is growing their per percentage, their proportion of companies at four times faster than the, 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 the rate that would just keep them even. That's a great thing. Um, I was kind of personally shocked to see Oxford at the bottom of the pile. But as I live in Cambridge, I was also quietly pleased. Um, and who knows what will happen? Who knows what will happen the following year? But again, that, that's a year, a year in thing. And it's, it's, uh, there's some, some question. We also just thought, well, on a regional basis, what's growing, what's shrinking, and are they all starting? As any two by two matrix, you want to be in the far right hand side. Um, and what's the movement? And as a, you know, either as a government or a monitoring or even, you know, a, you know a, a sort of a, an academic, um, what do you need to do to move from that place to that place? And is there a role for the university in that? And the good news is there's definitely a role for the university in that. Um, this just looks at the data again on a, you're trying to get small companies to grow large, and it was looking region by region, where was this actually occurring? Um, and what lessons could we learn from where it was occurring um, so that we could make it occur everywhere if we wanted it to? Um, we then started to look at student employer encounters with the scale-ups. Um, and this actually isn't at university. This is in secondary school. Um, but you can see it, you know, again, instead of an, it, it, looking at it, you can see in London and Cambridge and, you know, other places, you can chart that per thousand student population, some of them are getting a significant amount of student employer encounters. And those young people are making very different career decisions. And what we've also found is that there's a, a five-fold decrease of whether or not those children become neat after, afterwards. And there was a tripling of the number of children after four student employer encounters at secondary level that chose a STEM subject at A level. Um, that's very, very interesting. And what it was is there's some entrepreneurial teachers that were utilizing the assets in their communities to really good effect. There was no cost involved in getting an, inviting an entrepreneur into your classroom, just as there's no cost involved usually to get somebody to come in and speak to your university students. You are utilizing in a very entrepreneurial manner um, the assets that you don't control and that you don't pay, but you have access to. And um, that goes back to the Howard Stevenson definition of entrepreneurship. An entrepreneur is a person who utilizes assets that they don't own or control. Um, and I like that definition of entrepreneur because it's a process-oriented one rather than saying, that's a crazy person who started up a whole bunch of companies and floated them. Um, because I think we're all entrepreneurs and we can all act in an entrepreneurial way and with an entrepreneurial um, mindset, as you, as you no, no, no doubt know. <laughs> um, so in the UK, we're trying to chat, uh, check whether or not the number is growing as a proportion. Uh, and the good news is that on average, it is. The bad news is that in some regions, it's not. Um, but that's OK, because you can focus on helping those regions which are not growing to grow. Um, what is happening, and where is it particularly sensible? And how do you get to be in a growth situation? And all of these slides you can have, so you don't have to scribble or anything. Um, but it's really important, the barriers. So you've got ambitious people, um, but they have barriers. The biggest barrier for everybody is access to talent. The second biggest barrier for everyone um, is access to leadership development courses 
that are appropriate for them, appropriate for a fast-growing company. Um, and as university people, we should be slightly embarrassed about um, how often and how sparse um, our offerings are to leaders of scale-up companies from exec, from exec head. Um, the third worst thing is access to markets. So understanding what you need to do to sell internationally um, and also understanding what you need to do as a small company to sell to a large company. Um, after that is finance, and it's strange because most everybody whinges about finance all the time, but finance is not, in the grand scheme of things, very important. What is important is the talent and what the talent does and how you help the talent grow as they go through this, uh, this process. Um, and everybody in the ecosystem is important at helping these ambitious people to achieve their ambitions. You can't point the finger at the university and say, it doesn't work. You can't point the finger at the government and say, you're not doing your job. Um, to make it, to bring about the change, um, you need to bring everybody together and bring about this change together in a very collaborative way. Um, what's the price of collaboration or what's the price of non-collaboration? We um, ran some numbers and found that um, in those ecosystems and environments that were getting the outcomes, if they were collaborating, the cost of creating an additional job was 90 times lower than those who were acting in isolation. So the cost of creating a job in some environments was 38 to 39,000 pounds. The cost of creating jobs in collaborative ecosystems was down to 400, 500 pounds. So how important is it? This is looking at, this is what um, the CBI thinks, and the CBI has a, a, a bias towards larger type companies. Um, and for them, the low level of skills in the workforce is certainly the number one barrier to competitive advantage. Um, but only 56% of them say that. Um, if you look, and this is sort of from the CBI, but if you look at the scale-ups and the companies that are growing quickly and have been growing quickly, 82% um, of them are saying that the skills that are coming out of the universities and the secondary schools is certainly the number one, but it keeps 82% of them up at night. Um, and the, therefore, it comes back to there's definitely a role um, for those of us who are in university. Um, and many, many people talk about this. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is um, what is the role of universities? Is it just the academic side or is it also the intern, intern side and the work experience side and the interaction and collaboration with industry? Um, and I, I'm going to put the case to you that um, the interaction with industry and facilitating that for your students is, is, is a vital ingredient for all universities to bear in mind. 80% um, of um, WISE experts, which is like about 1,500 um, experts and um, talking about they actually think that a B student with a relevant internship is better than an A plus and an A student without one. And I think that's probably the case. Um, some horribly, horrible thing to suggest in this environment think that it's more important than a university degree itself. Um, and I, I don't particularly, I don't agree with that, but I think it's interesting and it, cause, it could cause us to, to think. You've got Peter Thiel who's challenging whether or not universities should exist at all and holding forth those examples um, about the relevancy, um, partially because of the interaction that we've got here. So I can do a canter between some, of, some examples, I think the roles that universities are playing, um, and that can give you some food for thought as you have your Guinnesses, and, uh, and uh, or is it Guinness or what is several Guinnesses? <laughs> don't know, probably can't say any of those after just one of them. I don't know if anybody's had Guinness before. Um, <laughs> Um, so this is, I um, just sort of went to Singapore, Singapore Management University to start, I should have collaborated with you earlier and just picked up the 14, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's interesting how they market their university to their students. Um, and I'm just going to pick out um, a couple things. So the first is um, engage with industry leader, leaders. Um, and that's, again, that's what they lead with for their university. It's not we've got smart professors or anything else. It's uh, we engage, you, we help you engage with industry leaders on real world issues. Um, but it's not just any old businesses. It's a scale up businesses. Um, looking at here, the 90%, um, they've got uh, their uh, you know, attribute is that 90% of our students have taken part in a global exposure program. That's pretty interesting. From a scale-ups point of view, if your scale-ups third problem is how hard it is to expand that 
that company into an international environment, if 90% of your students have experience doing that, then you're going to look a lot more attractive um, to a scale up. And it will be easier for you to expand your, uh, you know, your company afterwards to that. Um, I thought that I was really struck by this one. Up to six internships um, per student on average that they facilitate um, with real world experience. How many universities here can say that on average the students during their undergraduate get six internship possibilities? How many? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, so I think it's, it causes us to sort of think about a bunch of things. I'm going to skip over to Stanford. Um, really intrigued to see some of the partnerships that they do and some of the way they think about collaboration and exposing their, yeah, okay. <laughs> Go faster or cut it short. Um, anyway, so they're doing some very interesting things with collaboration. Um, and what I liked about it was, um, from what I understand, there's one full-time equivalent that's coordinating this program. Um, and it is focused on scale-ups and some large corporates as well. And you've got, again, fees uh, between 10,000 and 300,000 pounds for being a member of this. And it's research sharing. It's not the publications, but it's research sharing. So it's interesting. You can also make money as an academic institution by these collaborations. Uh, and it's a double-sided marketplace. Both are gaining, if you think about it, in the right, in the right way. Um, over to MIT. I was in one of the MIT sessions over here. This is looking at their, uh, the program where they pull their alumni back into the university, utilizing assets in their community um, and pulling them in both for the help of the faculty and also the students. Um, look over here at uh, Bocconi University in Italy. Um, they came up with a really interesting matchmaking program between large corporates and their small companies that were ambitious. And it was a collaboration with the, uh, with the Borsa Italiana. Um, and it was mentoring. It was teaching the little ones how to sell to the big ones. And it, for the big ones, it was letting them know what was really interesting that they should know about. And they measure success by the contracts, the procurement contracts between the smaller companies and the bigger companies that they were introducing to each other. Um, they also. Um, publicize exactly what they're doing so that you can slice and dice if you're in, let's say, aerospace. You can look at the companies that um, are interacting with each other, and you can choose them, and you can see a little bit more about them, which is, um, which is interesting. Um, I'm going to go over now to Strathclyde. Um, they've got a really, um, I think, an interesting growth advantage program, which is for scale-ups to help businesses that are scaling up in their community focus on their leadership development of the leaders of that scale-up. Um, if I go back to the elite one for a second, they, it used to be that you would go have an you know, owners and mentorship program, and you take a whole month off, and you go on executive education, and you would learn lots of things. Well, if your company is growing at 20% per annum, you're definitely not going to take a month off. Um, but you can, maybe every six weeks, take an afternoon off. Um, and um, we, I would like to see a lot more of that. I think it would have a huge amount of value to, um, to companies. So engaging with leaders, but thinking about whether or not it's just big companies or little companies, really important. How many of your students are on international programs so that they can help their companies go international and global afterwards? Um, very interesting. I don't know how many have up to six internships, but we should all think about that. Um, there's something that we do in secondary education that I don't believe is yet done at university size. This is a PhD waiting to happen. Um, but they rate the type of student employer encounter with the amount of evidence there is suggesting that it actually is impactful and it improves their employability. Um, and I haven't seen that maybe it exists at university. If it does, you can tell me over a Guinness later. Um, but if it doesn't, I think it would be useful. This allowed the entire industry to spring into action um, and work towards making sure there are student employer encounters at secondary level um, and um, maybe shortly will also at, uh, at primary. But this should, we should all be thinking about what kind of encounters for our students are the most impactful. Um, there are some things here looking at, again, making it easier for your students to engage with um, entrepreneurs. There are uh, in some parts of the UK at the moment, these facilities are made available so students can choose themselves who comes into their classroom. Um, these are, there are pre free platforms that exist, and this is Founders for Schools, um, but there are free platforms that exist where the students themselves can slice and dice and decide who they want to invite in 
as part of the activity with their, with their school. That's kind of fun. They just choose the entrepreneurs that they, that they want. They can choose industry. They can choose what, which curriculum match it is. They can choose whether or not the company is a fast-growing one or, or it's big and small. Um, and that's kind of interesting when you start thinking of the curation you've had to do for the people in this room. Passing that down to the students so they choose who's coming into their classes is kind of neat. It's not just a career coordinator's job any longer. It could be something else. Um, putting it into the hands, it, it, again, sort of the internships, which we know are important. Putting all the fast-growing companies like Raspberry Pi um, onto, onto maps so kids can click on them and get work experience at them in three or four minutes is neat. Maybe 1,600 apply for every Google position, but if they've applied to a Google position, you can see what that attribute is, and you know there's another company that's growing faster than Google um, that's two miles away, you can also suggest that to the student. And these sorts of facilities exist today, and they're making a real difference, and they're important to all of us. Um, so if you're not doing all of these things yet, please think about doing them. Um, if you think some of them aren't worth doing, then come and talk to me later, because I'd love to know why you think that, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll change my mind. I don't know. Um, but I'd be really interested. If, and if you know people that are doing work in this, um, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, but our ability to generate huge and drive the economic growth in our communities is immense. And no country can, can do it without their universities that's part of their community. So I put that to you. What you're doing here, this conference is really important, um, and taking back these messages to your own communities and your own places so you can drive the growth there, and therefore the prosperity of every citizen is, um, is really critical. So thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed being here, and there you go. Oh, hi. Thanks a lot. Ellen Farrell, um, St. Mary's University in Halifax, Canada. Um, so can you just give me a little bit of an idea of what you describe or what you're thinking about when you say an internship? I'm, I'm thinking that maybe we're thinking about two very different kinds of things. Um, there are about 25 different types of internships and there's a whole, there's some great research by NCUB, which is the um, National Center for University and Business here that did a paper on the different types of work experience and, and internships. Um, but there's no one internship, but it is where somebody takes a period of time. It depends on the sector, it depends on the industry, it depends on where the, you know, what academic program they're taking, but they spend time in industry. Sometimes that's two weeks, sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's a year. And there's different impacts of each of them, and some of them are known to not have very good impact or hardly any impact, and some are known to be off the charts in changing and transforming um, the, the student and their abilities. And I think even that question is a great one, because it, it opens up, well, what does that one single word mean? And it means different people, different things to different people. And we should all be, if we're going to have an internship program, well, what does it mean? And is this format better for natural science students? Or is this format better for chemistry students? And is it better that they have four one-week placements in four different companies or one four-week placement in one company? And I'm not aware of any research that gives us the definitive um, answers. I know there's some, there's some research that's been funded already by the GASB and by EEF looking at the answer, um, but it, it bears a lot more research. So if that's something you're researching, then let's, let's stay in touch. Um, I don't know, um, but it's, it's a great question. Because just as I put the research in secondary school level that's going on, lots of experiments. And we should all share these, you know, what we're learning, because you're kind of testing hypothesis. There are some formats, you know, you could have four entrepreneurs up, um, and sometimes there's no impact. Um, and that's probably because they did a panel. Um, but you have four entrepreneurs up, and they do them like mini TED Talks. And that's the format that was found to stimulate the tripling of students that chose a STEM subject. So four different people two formats, one had no impact, the other tripled the percentage of STEM students. And it's sharing the, that research um, widely amongst us um, and also coming up with new learnings that, um, that, that, that will help all of us into a different place. Um, Malcolm Byrne with the Higher Education Authority here in Ireland. And to look at the issue of internships, 
How do you convince companies uh, to take interns? And I'm looking particularly at uh, SMEs. Bigger companies, it's easier. But SMEs are put under pressure, often by government, but by schools, to take second level students as interns, to take people who are unemployed as interns, to take third level students, to take researchers as interns. Uh, how, one, do we ensure that there's obviously a meaningful experience, but how do we convince, especially SMEs, of the value of internship programs? Um, that's a, another brilliant question. Um, when we, so we've researched this for the last couple of years, and I'm sure there's others researching it uh, for even longer. Um, the, many of the programs for internships, I think you could argue, were designed by big companies for big companies. And so some of the programs that are out there are inappropriate for, for companies. So I just pose the, is four one-week placements better or worse from an, a learner's point of view than one four-week placement. Um, many of the internships are for long periods of time, and for a SME, that is an impossible ask, and that makes it difficult, even if they wanted to do it, for them to do that, because it's just it's a little bit hectic being in a company with, say, 15 to 30, 30 employees. So I think you know, creating platforms you know, like, like some of the platforms that, that are around that facilitate the brokering of um, mini assignments, so tasters. So uh, why wouldn't one, you know, if you're getting four weeks of experience, I actually think you could argue that four one-week slots far more effective than one month-long slot. But for a SME, a one-month, a one-week slot is possible, whereas a one-month not not ever possible because they just they just don't they can't control them their 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 environment that much um, particularly since they can't hire people they can't train people and they're turning down customer orders and then they're probably looking for finance as well um, so I think that we need to look at some of the policies we have particularly around internships and apprent and particularly also apprenticeship programs um, and ask if they were designed with small and medium-sized companies in mind or large companies um, I think there's some tweaks that you can make to the existing policy so, for instance, large companies could extend their apprenticeship programs into their value chain, into the SMEs that serve them in their value chain. So the bureaucracy that you need to set up a large program and administer a large program like that could extend into their value chains. Um, and I think that would be a terrific thing, and I hope it, you know, I think it's being considered, and I hope it, I hope it goes through. Um, I think the, it, it's also often the case that large companies get many, 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 many applications per spot. Um, and the small companies don't get any. Um, so just you know, changing, deflecting some of the flow from the, you know, the oversubscribed ones to the undersubscribed ones who would be willing um, to, to do it is again a, a, you know, an easy trick that you can use from other industries. It's like, oh, got too many here, what about, what about this one? Um, oh, you can't do a month, can you do a week? So again, it's just like a decision tree, getting it down to trying to, you know, trying to do that. And I would argue that using AI and machine learning and data, it's very much your friend here, because the cost of manually um, doing the matching that would be required um, in the old, you know, for large companies is, is, out of, you know, is at a systemic level way too costly. But creating an algorithm that can deflect someone from there to over to here, and then in, you know, turn what might be a three hour decision tree into five minutes for a SME is, is very much possible, and there are tools that are available to us um, already. Thanks.